Hello, welcome to the Better Living Through Learning channel. My name is Ed, and I am so excited that you have joined me today. This is going to be part two of our Sermon on the Mount series. And today, before we get into the text, we're going to talk about culture. So we're going to try to answer two questions. First of all, what is culture? And the second question is going to be, why is culture important when talking about the Bible? So our first question is going to be, what is culture? So culture, as defined as dictionary.com, is going to say, it's the customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social group. So in other words, what, what is culture? Well, culture can be art. It can be music. It can be celebrations. It can be clothing or possibly even language, or many, many, many other aspects that make one particular people group different than another people group. So in other words, culture is something that's going to separate one people group from another people group. Maybe it's language, maybe it's culture, maybe it's going to be somewhere they live, maybe it's a certain way that people dressed. So why is talking about culture so important? Well, talking about culture is important because most people tend to filter their experiences through their own culture. Like for example, if I'm eating something in my culture, my culture might find that particular dish totally acceptable in my culture. Why another culture might find that completely unacceptable. Or if I'm having a certain holiday celebration, uh, my culture might find that perfectly acceptable and other cultures might not be uh, accepting of that. So why is that important? Well, it's important because um, the Bible was written thousands and hundreds of years ago and it was written to another people group and another time and another culture. And I'm certainly not saying that the Bible isn't for us today because it was written so many years ago. But we have to keep in mind that the Bible was written many years ago to a different culture, to a different people group. So if we filter the Bible just through our own culture and our own experiences, then we might not fully understand what the Bible is really saying or what God is trying to say to us. So our second question is going to be, why is culture important in the context of reading the Bible, even the Sermon on the Mount? Well, let's take, for example, um, Luke chapter 15, verse 8. It says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully till she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. So, why is that important? Um, well, if I just take my culture and I talk about this whole coin issue, um, there are four major coins that I have in my culture that are in circulation that people use all the time. The first coin is called a penny. And a penny is gonna be one one hundredth of a dollar. Uh, what can I buy with a penny? Well, not much of anything really. Um, uh, there's a grocery store near me that children can ride a mechanical horse for a penny. But other than that, I really can't think of anything that I could buy with a penny. So that coin ha has almost no buying power. Well, the second coin that is major in my culture is called a nickel. A nickel is worth five cents or one twentieth of a dollar. Um, and what can I buy with a nickel? Well, except for ri five rides on that horse, really nothing. There's nothing that I could buy with that nickel. The nickel itself has almost no buying power. So the next major coin that we have in my culture would be the dime or 10 cents. It's worth one tenth of a dollar or again, 10 cents. Well, how much buying power does that dime have? Well, I might be able to buy one piece of candy at certain stores or maybe a pencil, um, something very, very small. So the dime itself has almost no buying power in of itself. Uh, the next major coin that I have in my culture is going to be the quarter. So quarter is going to be worth 25 cents or one fourth of a dollar. What can I buy with a quarter? How much buying power does a quarter have? Well, quarter, I could buy maybe two pencils, maybe one piece of cheese uh, from a, a counter that sells it, 
um, maybe two pieces of candy. So the corner itself doesn't have much buying power. So if I think of the story of the woman who lost her coin in the context of my own culture, I might be missing out on what God is really saying. So in this story, the woman has 10 coins on the ground. I'm going to grab 10 coins that I have right here in my hand so you can see all those. And I went ahead and chose quarters. So quarters is going to be the highest value of coin that is commonly carried in my culture. So I have 10 of them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And all together, these coins are going to equal $2.50. So what is the buying power of $2.50? Well, maybe I could go to the dollar store uh, where things are sold for a dollar and buy two things. I might be able to buy a couple of pieces of fruit. Uh, I might be able to buy maybe a couple of packs of pencils. So I am going to be able to buy things with my 10 quarters, with my $2.50. But it's not going to be a lot. It's going to be very little. So in the story, a woman loses one of her coins. Well, let's pretend we lose one of the coins. And now I have $2.50. Well, my buying power has not changed that much. Um, I'll look for that quarter for a couple of minutes, but if I lose uh, that one quarter, it's not really a great loss for me. So something is not connecting between my culture and this woman's culture, between the way I think of coins and the way that this Bible story is describing coins. I just lost a quarter, 25 cents. To me, because of its low buying power, uh, it's not very significant for me. I'm not going to try very hard to find it. I'm going to look for a couple minutes and then I'm going to give up because it's not that valuable. So somehow there is a disconnect between what the Bible is saying and what um, my culture is saying to me. What is going on with these coins? Well, if we do just a little bit of research, it turns out that that coin that the one, that's one, when that woman has is called a drachma. And the drachma was worth one day's wage. So that means if I worked in the vineyard for a day, or if I worked digging a ditch, or if I worked in the field harvesting wheat, or if I took care of some animals, or if I worked generally a labor job, that at the end of the day, I would get paid one of these coins. So how can I take that coin and that context of that culture and understand um, my culture a little bit better. Well, I can think about that coin as one day's wage and then think about in my culture what a person might get paid in that kind of job for an entire day's work. Well, in my culture, it would be about $100. So in my culture, we make a $100 bill. Um, a day's labor would be about maybe $100 for that kind of medium. Some people get paid more, some people get paid a little bit less, but we can think of it in about $100 for my culture at least. Maybe you have something different in your culture that you can think of as somebody getting paid for one day's uh, labor or one day's work. So for me personally, that makes a lot more sense. So instead of thinking about it like a penny, nickel, dime, or quarter, now I'm thinking about this coin being worth a full day's wage. In my culture, that would be $100. Well, we talked about the buying power of penny, nickel, dime, quarter. Let's talk about the buying power of $100. What could I buy with $100? Well, in my culture, I could probably buy about 30 gallons of milk. Or I could buy an entire week's worth of groceries, an entire week's worth of food for a family of four people. Or I could go out to a really nice dinner with one other person three times. So the buying power of this $100 has, is significant. It's not anything small. And so we look at this Bible story and we see this woman has 10 of these. 10 of these coins all together. And then she loses one. Well, for me, that would be having like 10 $100 bills. She has $1,000. Well, what can I buy with $1,000? Well, I could buy, um, I could live in an apartment for an entire month, or I could buy an entire car. So now, instead of her having something that has very low buying power, like it would be in my culture, 
Now she has something significant. It's important. It's a lot. And then the Bible says that she loses one. Well, for me personally, if I had $1,000 in 10 $100 bills, if I lost one of those, I'm going to search my entire house. I'm going to take the time to look for it. I'm going to take the time to try to find that. And then when she finds it, she is super happy. So if I just take that story and I just stretch it over to my culture, um, I'm going to be confused. There's going to be a disconnect. But if I take the time to understand what is significant in that culture, then I can create sort of a parallel in my own culture and help fully understand the Bible story. And that's what we're going to do in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's why culture is important in reading the Bible, because we tend to, as people, filter our experiences through our own culture. But understanding the Bible means that we understand the culture that was written in, and then how does that kind of draw a straight line or parallel over to our own culture. I am super excited about studying the Sermon on the Mount with you. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you have the best day. Goodbye.